to West Pokot. West Pokot is a hilly, dry area in the Rift Valley in Kenya where the Pokot people live. They are pastoralists who tend livestock and grow some crops on small landholdings. They raise cattle, goats, and sheep, but cattle are particularly valued and culturally important because the community life and economy is so closely associated with them. Over the past few decades, this landscape has been changing and efforts are being made to restore and regenerate the land. It is this process that we will be presenting here. Land degradation and soil erosion has contributed to the formation of deep gullies. People in their 50s say that when they were going to school, these gullies were not there. But year after year, they have seen the gullies growing to the point that now it is hard to visit neighbours, and paths that children used to take to go to school now drop off steeply. Some people have moved their homes and some others have even left the area. There are many factors that have contributed to these gullies, including overgrazing, tree cutting, droughts, and more. So, mostly it's about the, the biophysical of the area. Yeah. When you see there are really limited trees, um, the other issue is the soil. Yeah. The soil is uh, more sandy. Mm -hmm. and the other very key issue is about there have been limited uh, intervention done to, to, to prevent or otherwise to, you know, to slow down the speed of water. The general perception is that the gullies were brought by God and people have no control over them. Sand harvesting is part of the context. Sand from West Pocot is considered to be very high quality and is sought after for construction projects. With the boom in the construction industry in Kenya, there is great demand for sand, and there are many trucks transporting it. Although sand harvesting is big business, the young people from the villages who load the trucks by hand were being paid pittance, and the area residents from whose land, in fact their farms, the sand comes, received nothing. When community members became aware of this situation in late 2015, they resolved not to allow sand harvesting from the area where they had sand dams. But this was not enough to restore the degraded lands. First, this perception that nothing can be done needed to shift. An exchange visit was organized with a small group of community members from West Pokot to the Tigray region in Ethiopia, where a very degraded landscape had been successfully regenerated. The visitors came home and told other community members about what they had seen and discussed what could be used in their community or adapted to their context. Later on, a trip to eastern Kenya was organized with a larger group, including many young people. Until then, youth were not particularly involved in the project and could even be negatively affected by it because of a loss of income as they stopped sand harvesting. In addition, visiting a project in Kenya made it easier for the groups to communicate with each other using Kiswahili, a shared language. This trip was very inspirational, as the visitors saw what people had accomplished in a dry area like theirs by working together, restoring land to the point that they are now selling food. Meanwhile, some other steps were being taken to combat erosion. There are riverbeds where water runs off very quickly during rains, eroding the land and carrying sand away. The community has created several sand dams to slow the water runoff and hold back the sand and topsoil. These consist in a stone and mortar dam created by a paid stonemason and volunteer work by community members working in two groups, one on the lower side, downstream, and the other on the upper side, upstream. So they'll go help the other group, yeah, I see, yeah. in the upper part of the... Yeah. And how much time does it actually take to do something like this, would you say? About uh, two, two and a half weeks, or almost three weeks. Because mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah, they have to start by collecting the, the materials, the stones, and uh, the sand, of course, they have to scavenge around the, the riverbed. Community members can see water building and coming close to the surface. When a borehole was built near the sand dam, they did not have to dig deep, and this well is currently serving all of the community, over 300 households. People come with donkeys and fetch water. This water is feeding 
more than 300 households around this area. Mm -hmm. People are coming with donkeys and, mm -hmm. and fetching that water. Mm -hmm. So it proves the hypothesis that if you block the water from moving and let the water percolate, and then high chances is that you're building the, the water mass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Work on the sand dams and on terracing on individual farms is going on at the same time. The terracing creates micro-catchments which hold moisture and provide an environment where grasses and eventually trees could grow. It also creates flat fields where they will be planting crops, such as sorghum, millet, and groundnuts. This is a communal effort with the work being done on a rotating basis, farm by farm. There are two farmer groups, one downhill and one uphill. The groups are based on affinity and include families and neighbours. In the end, the objective is that all farms will have benefited from the terracing. Very gradually, they are also making changes to the way they manage their animals. While pastoralists do not like to confine their animals, they are collecting urine and manure at night time while the animals are close to home. They are also using exclosures, limiting access to certain areas. So where does the research come into this project? Past research has shown that community buy-in and ownership of rehabilitation efforts is needed for success. Farmer involvement and listening to their voices is essential in understanding underlying issues affecting their production dynamics and relationships. So this research project aims to involve farmers in playing a key role in rehabilitating their lands. This means build the capacity of farmer groups on leadership, group dynamics and technical skills on landscape rehabilitation, and also to integrate existing indigenous knowledge and scientific information. Alongside efforts to develop soil and water conservation and monitoring strategies that work for farmers, this network of farmers, researchers, and other partners will conduct crop diversity trials. The reason that this kind of research is needed is that when these farmers started practicing settled agriculture, they took up maize farming, which is very risky in an area with unreliable rainfall. Maize needs regular rainfall and decent levels of soil fertility, yet fertilizer and seed inputs are quite expensive. So other crops such as sorghum, finger millet, and cassava are better suited to the area, and the project is making it possible for farmers to assess which ones will be most reliable and productive on their lands. Farmers will therefore be able to select suitable food crops, fodder, and fruit trees that meet their food and nutritional needs. The research activities include farm fertility assessments and various biophysical measurements on soil and water conservation, as well as participatory mapping and other activities involving community members. Partners in this farmer research network include the Kenyan Environment Service, which is interested in the issue of sand harvesting, and the Kenyan Forest Service, which promotes fruit trees. Each farmer research network is unique in its emphasis on different dimensions, such as participation, farmer engagement, data collection, and networking. This project has so far emphasized farmer engagement and community mobilization most, that is, getting farmers involved in deciding what out outcomes they want to aim for. It is hoped that this will create a solid base for expanding the network, involving more farmers, and carrying out relevant local research and action that can have an impact on landscapes, livelihoods, and food security.